Find the strong man. Jesus talks about the strong man. That's the, whatever demon is of highest ranking authority. Demons are organized like military. There are those who lead, there are those who follow. I don't want to waste my time going after every buck private. I want to know who's in charge and I want to get this over with. Some people, I know they don't do this and they end up going for hours. I mean, 10, 12, 14 hour meetings. No way. Satan loves to show off. They'll send up all the buck privates for trial first. You're exhausted and worn out and confused by the time you even get to a general. I command that you convey your answers to the person and they will convey uh, your answers to me. You will not speak to me because you are on trial and under the authority delegated to me by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you engage a demon directly, that elicits their pride. They must speak to the person. The person serves as translator. They tell you what they're hearing or seeing. If Satan's been lying, accusing, condemning them, they're listening to him all the time, or I should say a demon. They're listening to him all the time anyways, so may as well just have them tell you what they're hearing and the answers that are being conveyed. Think of it like a translator. I command that you not change your authority structure, hide, duplicate your identity, or change your name. If you don't do this, they'll send up one demon, he'll say, my name's Hank. Then they'll send up another demon saying, my name's Hank, and you'll think, oh, we, it's failing. They're not going. Well, that's because they're changing their name. They'll, they'll invert their authority structure. You'll say, I command the one who's in charge, and they'll invert their authority structure. And just like in a war, if you capture a bunch of POWs, you say, who's the general? Well, they put the general hat on a buck private because nobody cares if he takes one. And all of a sudden, the general's dressed up like a buck private, hoping not to get you know, brought to trial. No inverting the authority structure. No changing the names. No alteration of the truth. There will be no profanity. I don't want to hear him curse God and Jesus this and Jesus that. No way. I don't want to hear that. You will answer every question directed to you clearly, concisely, immediately, completely, truthfully. It's saying, I want an answer right now and I want the truth. I don't want you to wait for 10 hours and try and exhaust me and wear me down. I command you'll not have any outside help or reinforcement during this trial. I need more demons showing up in my office to join in on the party. We're not doing that. I command that the answers you give must stand as truth before the white throne of the Lord God Almighty. Some will say you don't ask any questions of a demon because they're liars and they lie. And I say, I know they lie, but when they stand before the white throne of God mentioned in Revelation, all truth will be known and I check it by that. I'll show you how that's done. Uh, when convicted, there will be one way traffic only from the demon to the pit, right? You're not gonna go bother anyone else at any time, especially those in the room and our families. You're not gonna enter another person. You're not gonna hassle other people. Worst thing you can do is cast a demon out and not send it to the pit. You cast a demon out, it just goes to, I don't know, one of your kids, somebody else. Bind you by any name you give and name you if needed. Some demons in the Bible, we don't know their names. Some we do. Jesus calls one legion. We know Satan's name. I ask them, what is your name? If they don't tell me, I'll give them a name. Sometimes it's a stall tactic to make this thing last forever. I bind you by the ground, uh, I command you to only speak which can be used against you. I don't wanna hear about all the stuff you've done and how many generations you've been at work and how many children you've molested and how many women you've raped, how many men you've turned into addicts and how many people you've gotten to kill themselves. I don't wanna hear your boasting just your condemnation. I just want to know what I need to know so we can sentence you. That's all. And my goal in knowing this is not, is not for any other purpose than the counselee to know this is a real demon. It's really been at work. Here's all the bad things he said, done. I shouldn't say he, it. I think they're gender neutral. They're not male or female. Um, they may manifest as male and female, but they're spirits. They don't have the anatomical structure that we do. Um, I just want the person to know what's been going on so that they don't ever mess around with a demon again. Um, I bind you by the ground rules we lay down, command there be no control of the mind, confusion of the mind, the tongue or the body, and that the person will maintain complete self-control and they won't undergo any harm. I don't want their eyes rolling back in their head. I don't want their voice changing. I don't want their mind confused. Sometimes I'll tell people, okay, in the middle of it, here, read this Psalm. They say, I can't even see it. I can't see. I mean, they go blind, they can't hear things, they go deaf. Get rid of all of that with ground rules. It's just all stall tactics. Again, imagine having a trial with no rules and no bailiff and no shackles. Craziness. You'll take all of your associates and all of their collective works with you, right? 
So if I get the demon who's in charge, I want all the associate demons working with him and all of their works and effects to go, meaning if you made him sick, take the sickness. You gave him some sort of chronic ailment, ailment rather, take it with you. I command you to take it all with you. And I ask the Holy Spirit, I don't, you don't command the Holy Spirit. You, know, you lay down the ground rules, you command the demon. You don't command the Holy Spirit to do anything. He's God. You ask him to rule over all the spirits, force them to cooperate according to the ground rules, and punish any who seek to disobey. So I lay down the ground rules after sharing the gospel with the person, explaining what we're going to do. And I basically tell them, we're going to see if demons are at work in your life. And we're going to have a trial. We're going to do First John 4. We're going to test the spirits. We're going to do it by Ephesians 6. We're going to use faith and prayer and the Bible and Jesus. And this isn't going to be crazy or funky. I'm going to ask you questions. You tell me the answers. We're going to confess sin, repent of it, pray, and get this junk out of your life. We're just going to use the gospel. I then make uh, declarations of truth. We declare the following uh, as truth before the white throne. That's the judgment seat of the Lord God Almighty. Number one, Luke 8, 10, 18 through 20. We claim protection from and authority over Satan and demons. Jesus says, I have given you authority over Satan and demons. We claim our position, number two, in Christ and all things that are under Christ's authority under our authority, Ephesians 1, 18 through 2, 8. Sometimes I'll read these verses or just explain them. That Christ is over all and that I am seated with Christ. And so it is under me as well. That's where Paul tells the Corinthians that Christians will even judge the what? The angels, he says. So in judging demons, we're not doing anything we weren't made to do. We are going to judge the angels in the end. Perfectly fine to judge a few in the middle as well. And we claim our victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Colossians 2, 13 through 15. That he disarmed the powers, the demons that were against us. He took away our sin and he has crushed Satan and demons and Jesus' victory is ours. Then I ask him this, and this comes out of their homework. Give me the two or three primary areas that are the most troubling if you want to deal with one thing, two things, three things. What's the big thing you want to get rid of? It's killing you. What's the, what's the place we start? I start with a big issue rather than the little issue so that we can get off to a good start, that they're not exhausted, that we build some momentum, that they see what we are doing works. I then ask them to confess sins and cancel ground uh, and uh, command leaving one at a time. So I'll say, okay, before we start, you know, how did you open the door, proverbial speaking? Well, you know, I was uh, committed adultery. And then after that, I started having night terrors. Well, guess what? Probably a connection there, huh? Probably open the door with adultery. Have you ever really repented of that to Jesus and asked him to forgive you? Not really? Well, let's do that right now. Let's stop right now and let's, re let's have you repent of that sin, ask Jesus to forgive you. He died, received forgiveness. Let's get, because see, Satan and demons with the believer, in addition to sort of external torment and such, most of what they have is what we've given them by opening the door through sin. Well, then confess it as a sin, kick them out, let's lock the door. But you've got you to gotta straighten this out with Jesus. You've got to repent. So a good chunk of the time is just spent in repentance of particular sin. That's all it is. Getting rid of those handholds and footholds. Um, I then ask them a series of questions. This is where we start. Number 10. Uh, I, I usually will check with ancestral sin, and I'm looking at their past. You know, if they come from 10 generations of third-degree masons, I'm starting there. Right? If their grandma was uh, into witchcraft and their mama was into witchcraft and they have some demonic issues, uh, it shouldn't be shocking to think that this has been an issue in their family for a while. I know one family where incest was just part of the family. They actually had very intricate rules to control incest. That grandfathers and uncles could molest little girls, but daddies couldn't. And you could only do that once they hit the age of 10. You couldn't molest any child before they... Like they had these complicated rules that have been passed down for generations for the sexual abuse of the children. You're like, well then this, you know, your struggles here or your temptations or your issues, they have generational lineage. There are whole family lines that are just demonically inspired. Do you ever wonder why in the Old Testament... God will occasionally tell his people, when you go to war against that nation, kill all of them. Don't let one of them live. People say, oh, that's, that's terrible. Not if that whole line is demonized. Not if that whole line of people exists for the express purpose of fighting God and killing his people. The issue is you either get rid of them or they're going to get rid of you. Satan is inspiring them to destroy you and you've got to get rid of them. 
Satan does work through family lines. There are family lines like the Herods who 